Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Happy Indigenous Columbus Day, everyone. Howdy. Hi, Matt. Happy Columbus Day. Uh, Nick, I understand you have some thoughts about Columbus's uh, uh, recently discovered <laughs> yeah. origins. You yeah, wanna... now uh, I am happy to announce that it appears that it's not an Italian American who's responsible for the decimation of native people, but uh, somebody probably born in Spain or Portugal uh, who was Jewish. He was That's a the latest, the latest on uh, on uh, good old Columbus. That's uh, the, just the the forensic uh, archaeology going on these days is boggles the mind. Uh, before we actually get started in talking about anything, uh, Catherine, I understand that you won't be able to concentrate. You'll be like a kid um, who does the things and can't concentrate in class uh, unless you're allowed to bubble forth in excitement over uh, Elon Musk's rocketry. Do you want to explain to us what happened this weekend and what it means and why it's important? I would love to. So you're basically, uh, you, you made an IEP for me for this podcast and I get like a fidget spinner and one of those stools that like wiggles around so I can pay attention. Thank you so much. Um, uh, extra time to take your test. Extra time to take my test. Rockets, everybody. We had a great weekend for rockets. Uh, Elon Musk uh, sent up yet another rocket, but this time they caught it standing up in the scaffolding thingy. It's called Mechzilla, which... Okay, you know, if you want to be like that, but um, so that's a reference to the Godzilla oh movies. I hate you so Stop much. It. <laughs> and Mexicans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's C H, not X. It's important to note. Um, so oh, come on. you're so naive. The that's a reference to robot jocks. <laughs> You know what? I'm actually. They can't even. They can't even bring me down, Matt. These idiots, because yeah. the rocket was so cool. Um, my favorite response, well, two favorite responses on Twitter. First, thank you to the many, many people who just tagged me in the video of it on Twitter. They knew I had seen it, but they were like, do you want to see it again? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I do. I want to see it as many times as possible. And also to one of the, the finest tweets about this out there, which uh, totally deadpan said, you know, we should really remember that SpaceX isn't the only company operating in this space. Boeing, for example, uh, is a great company which is leading both on spending and on workforce diversity, which, as we know, are the drivers of growth. And it was just like perf perfection in the deadpan. Um, you know, we all have a mixed relationship with Elon Musk, but catching that rocket on its way down was extremely cool. And we got to give him that. What does it mean that we can do now going forward or or maybe do soon? It's all in the service of just sending up the same vehicles as quickly as possible over and over because the man actually wants to go to Mars. Like he's got a lot of stuff going on with him and he's very distracted and maybe he's not going to be able to do it. But this is what happens when you have a kind of major long-term goal in mind is that you work toward it. And one thing that we need to do is get a whole bunch of stuff off of Earth into space very, very cheaply. And so this is all in the service of kind of reusable, fast turnaround rocketry so that we can get launch costs down to as cheap as a dumb airline ticket or whatever. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Now you have to pay attention. Even OK, I'll be right. You're going to make me about... talk about presidential politics. Is that what you're going to do to me? We're going to talk about Boog Powell for the next 55 <laughs> minutes. That's uh -huh. fantastic. No deal. <laughs> That's fake. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. <laughs> uh, we're actually going to talk about tax baby uh in a moment but first we're going to hear a word from our sponsors over at st john's college friends do you know who is welcome at st john's college everyone that's who's welcome uh from america's founding fathers to the greek philosophers to contemporary critics who question everything uh, at St. John's College, students encounter Adam Smith and Karl Marx, James Baldwin and Virginia Woolf, St. Augustine and Nietzsche. Here, there are no secondary sources, no experts, no one telling you what to believe. Rather, it's original sources and a community devoted to collaborative inquiry, intellectual humility, and the discomfort 
that comes from encountering diverse opinions. Explore 3,000 years of human thought on campuses in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Annapolis, Maryland. For master's degree candidates, St. John's also offers studies in the great texts of the East in person or online. Uh, learn more at sjc.edu slash reason. That is sjc.edu slash reason. Go there today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Uh, so uh, do you know what's going to happen three weeks from tomorrow? The election is going to happen three weeks from tomorrow. Our long national nightmare will be uh, adapted and extended in different ways. It's all very exciting. Uh, we thought here at the roundtable we would start help you assist you in your comparison shopping if that's where you're at or even if not um just ammunition to uh get into arguments with um beginning uh with one of the main areas of difference actual tangible policy difference between the two major candidates running for uh president and that is taxes uh broadly speaking though the candidates would uh surely bulk at my description here. It's a contest between tax and spend and tax cut and spend with former uh, President Donald Trump inventing new stuff to not pay taxes on literally every single appearance that he makes. Um, and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris emphasizing in every one of her appearances that uh, she's going to do a broad-based middle-class tax cut for 100 million Americans or whatever, uh, while quietly she's going to uh, hike every possible tax on all those rich people that you don't like. Um, pretty much all tax proposals, as we know, have to be run through Congress, so there's usually a gap between uh, campaign promises and the reality, which we'll kind of get into a little bit. Um, then again, most presidents do get to have some of their tax ideas enacted in law. Most people get a bite at the apple. Um, so uh, we will uh, uh, get a sense of that as well. So uh, let's start with Trump. Peter, uh, is there a method or at least like a theme to Trump's uh, seeming madness of, uh, of proposing new areas of human activity that will be exempt from taxation uh, under the uh, 2.0 Trump administration, car loans, over overtime pay, emergency generator purchases, retroactive. That was a new one from this weekend. Um, is he starving the income tax beast in some way and heading towards consumption taxes and tariffs? On the one hand, it might seem kind of random, and Trump is certainly known for his brain farts. But I think there is at least a little bit of a method here because Trump isn't just a random brain farter, though he is partially that. Uh, he he is somebody who is an just an incredible, uh, relentless panderer. And he just tells people what they want to hear in the moment, whether or not it actually makes any sense, uh, whether or not it's a good idea, whether or not it's the sort of thing that you want to that uh, that is coherent in terms of his overall plans and his agenda. And so that absolutely uh, applies to his tax policy ideas that we have seen over the summer. So in Las Vegas, you get no tax on tips because there are a lot of people who make a lot of money, uh, who make their living off of tips in Las Vegas. In Michigan, you get no tax on auto loans. When you're talking to people in the aftermath of a storm, it's no tax on generators, I guess. That was that was a new one to me. And because Trump loves the, the, the elderly so much, it's no tax on Social Security. And what all of this would do is it would blow a hole in the budget because Trump is proposing to re to reduce taxes uh, and to reduce tax revenue without actually reducing spending. And so you see polls of economists that, that suggest that Trump would be worse on inflation, would have bigger deficits. The Trump campaign totally denies this but won't provide any specifics. They're just like, those Wall Street elites, they won't tell you the truth. Well, Trump won't tell you the truth either, but he will pander to you. And whatever thing that you dislike or, or uh, rely on most in the world, he's going to do some sort of tax Tax tweak. This seems to be his entire approach to taxes and the economy. And the thing is, it's totally unserious, but there are some real serious tax issues that are coming up because the Tax Cuts and Job Act, the TCJA, the big tax bill that was passed under uh, Trump during his first presidency, all of the individual tax or nearly all of the individual tax provisions in that law are set to expire at the end of 2025. That is basically not on either presidential campaign's radar right now. Kamala Harris has sort of vaguely gestured, at, oh, we'll keep the tax, uh, we'll keep taxes low for people making less than $400,000 a year, but she won't say much more than that. She won't actually really specify how she's going to go uh, go go ahead and do this. But there, there are big tax changes coming no matter what, no matter who is president. And the tax discussion that we're, we are having is pandering and unserious. Nick, there's an argument that many libertarians 
make. Uh, which there are those who argue. Thanks. Uh, that it, that basically every tax cut is a good idea because it deprives the government from the ability to, you know, extort or, or pry into your own uh, property and uh, do so in a way that violates your privacy sometimes as well. Um, you disagree with that. Why? Uh, well, uh, first of my favorite version of that is when I uh, have made the argument uh, in various places that, uh, you know, Ill currently illegal drugs should be treated like beer, wine, and alcohol. And it's always the libertarian who's like, so you're in favor of increasing taxes. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, uh, you know, it's like, you, you got me, bub. Uh, yeah, I, the, I think that we have reached a level of policy nihilism uh, among broad uh, parts of the um, of the tax cutting uh, public. It's mostly on the right, but not always. But if you are just going to say that the best thing you can do is reduce taxes all the time, anywhere, under any circumstances, without any in, uh, any consideration of of spending, uh, you're just creating arguably, and actually, I wouldn't even say arguably, like an equal or larger problem down the road. I mean, we have had uh, last year. Uh, spending was six point two trillion dollars. Revenue was four point four trillion dollars, and that's a very typical year for the past decade or so. You know, roughly speaking, in terms of percentages, we need to recognize. You know, as Milton Friedman said, that the ultimate uh, measure of government uh, activity and government influence and government presence in your life is the amount government spends. Um, and if you want to just keep saying we're going to spend more, maybe tax more, maybe not, whatever we're going to run into trouble, especially when it comes to things like Social Security and Medicare, because that is already happening. Um, and we can either fix these things in a way that is not unbelievably disruptive, if not catastrophic to the economy and to everyday life, or uh, we can just pretend like this doesn't matter. Uh, starve the beast as an actual semi-serious policy uh, uh, platform, which started in the 80s and really took hold in the 90s, argued that if you were deprive government of spending, uh, you know, through uh, cutting revenue, eventually would have to stop spending. That argument has been shown to be completely erroneous. Government does not seem to have a limit on what it will borrow or create or fool around with. So I think if we're interested in having uh, responsible conversations about the size, scope, and spending of government and what that means and what a consensus in America might look like, we should talk a lot about how taxes, uh, uh, either increases in them or or decreases in them, have to be joined with, uh, you know, a, a, as serious a discussion about what we're spending. Just very briefly, Nick said that uh, there, the policy nihilism is mostly a problem on the right. I think the right has really serious problems with the way that they're thinking about economic policy right now. But if you look at the left, what they are essentially advocating for over the last several years is something that resembles a kind of low-tax socialism. Okay, it's not exactly socialism, but it is very influenced by the way that the Nordic countries that are the closest things that we have to kind of social economic, uh, social democracies, uh, that, that they, it's very influenced by the way that they organize their welfare states. But it's not at all influenced by the way that they set up their tax systems, which rely on much higher tax rates for the middle class. And the left wants to have the spending levels of the Nordic countries without the tax rates. And that just doesn't add up and it doesn't make sense. And it is a kind of policy nihilism that you see in the, on, the center, on the center left right now. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. And what gives that cover, because that is essentially what Kamala Harris is talking about. She wants to spend a lot more and raise taxes in very complicated, stupid ways a little bit more. Her nobody is nobody who looks at her plan says, "Oh, she's covering the new spending with uh, new tax increases." But what gives cover to that mentality is the absolute bullshit on the right, where they're just like, "No, well, you know what? When you cut taxes, you get more revenue, so we can cut taxes to zero and get more tax revenue than ever, uh, and that means that we can spend a bunch of money on on complete fucking horseshit." So. Uh Catherine, uh, let's uh, give some equal time to the uh, anarchists, uh, taxation is theft crowd here, meaning you. Um, is Donald Trump the clear anti-theft candidate in this case? <clears throat> I think actually in this case, the thing that comes to my mind over and over in this election cycle is taxation is also bullying. And uh, so <laughs> many of these proposed changes are just trying to get people to act different. They're trying to get people to make different choices than they currently make. Now, to be clear, 
the status quo is a nightmarish labyrinth of bizarre incentives on all kinds of behaviors, including, um, you know, the mortgage interest rate deduction, which pushes people to buy houses, including um, to the extent that it works, the uh, child tax credits, which push people to have kids. There's like many, many places, uh, obviously, the way that people allocate their um, their assets is hugely determined by the tax code. And that's unavoidable, unavoidable as long as there are taxes at all. But so many of the current like brain fart proposals from both candidates are actually about changing people's behavior and will change people's behavior in ways that they don't want to admit. So, for example, the no taxes on tips thing. Do you want to tip everyone in your life? Because that's what's going to happen if we actually did no taxes on tips, which we won't. It'd be like, oh, uh, tip your tax accountant. Tip your dentist. Tip your tip everyone because your of course you know tip what, Catherine? Policeman. Some of us who live in Brooklyn already do tip all those <laughs> Matt, people. Matt, Matt, who's <laughs> living the next year as Frank Sinatra for a book project, you've been t- tipping everybody. Absolutely horrible. Uh, this is a thing that people explicitly complain about: the fact that we've shifted into a culture where um, more of certain classes of service workers rely on tips in ways that are, um, you know, suboptimal for consumers. This will shove us all the way in that direction. Interest on car loans? Oh, gee, what do you think is going to happen? You think people will just continue with like super reasonable car purchases where they, uh, you know, price the interest into their into their family budget? I don't think so. Um, You know, and that's before you even get into the corporate tax rate stuff, which, of course, has a much bigger impact on the economy. So, yes, taxation is theft. But more importantly, in this election cycle, taxation is bullying. This is this is the federal government putting its thumbs on every scale about how you live your life. The wonk term of art here is regulation through the tax code. And that's very Bullying. much what is happening here. Bullying. Uh, Peter, um, let's talk a little bit about the policy nihilism aspect of it. You can sustain a policy nihilism when the uh, horrible future uh, fails to materialize. And one thing that I hear from some people who are otherwise libertarian curious is like, yeah, yeah, you guys have been whining about entitlements now for f- my whole life. And I don't see any problems. It, the, the thing that's supposed to happen, yeah, come on, the thing is not happening uh, yet. So why not do the nihilism? Um, so can you tangibilize, which is definitely a word, yeah. um, uh, maybe like even sp- specifically uh, when you factor in what uh, Trump is proposing or suggesting sometimes to do, which is to uh, not just uh, uh, remove taxation on Social Security benefits, but I think also some of the contributions into Medicare. Um, what's going to happen? How is the, How are we going to get to that day? And when is that day coming when it imposes reality on us that we can't postpone anymore? So- One thing that we have occasionally mentioned on this podcast, and by we, I mean I, is that the fake trust funds that fake fund our entitlements uh, are going to run out at some point here. And so those the dates have been, uh, you know, jumping around over the past few years, uh, the expected dates where the trust funds are are depleted. But it's in in general, at at this point, it's floating around sometime around in the the mid to early 2030s for both the hospital insurance trust fund and Medicare and then the uh, Social Security trust fund. And what Trump's proposal to tax to, to not tax Social Security would do is it would make that depletion happen sooner. In fact, the reason that we tax Social Security is because in the 1980s, they were like, uh, we're going to run out of fake money here. So we'd better start taxing this uh, th- this program and, and the revenue from it. And that's going to extend the shelf life of the uh, 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 of the trust fund. And so Trump is actually it's amazing that he is running both on don't tax Social Security. And also it would be totally immoral to touch Social Security at all. He is not planning to fix it. He has no idea how he's going to actually fund the gap that he creates there. And he is going to he's it's not just that he's not planning to fix it or do anything about the fact that it's going to extend Expire. It's that he now is proposing something that would actually make it expire sooner. And so that you would run out of fake money uh, a year or two earlier. Now, one thing to remember about this is that changes to Social Security are much more difficult under current congressional rules, specifically the rules uh, surrounding the filibuster uh, and reconciliation bills, the Byrd rule, which generally does not um, does not let you pass changes to Social Security without 60 votes. It is very difficult to imagine that Trump 
Trump could actually muster 60 votes for this. It's just a much higher threshold. You'd run into both partisan and budgetary dynamics there. And so making those changes to Social Security, I think, is probably more likely to be bluster in the end because Trump, as we know, just brain farts this stuff into existence because he likes to pander and uh, say stuff that will sort of sound good in the moment. He doesn't actually care whether anybody is going to do it a year or two from now when if he becomes president. But, uh, but the fact that he is running on, you absolutely cannot touch Social Security, we would never do that, and all also, a plan to touch Social Security and make the trust fund run out faster really tells you just sort of what level of seriousness you're looking at with uh, with the Trump campaign and its approach to economic policy. At, at the same time, you know, there's something insane about taxing Social Security payments. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, it, whole, you know, so, the whole design yeah. of the system is insane. Yeah, Every element yeah. of it, right? It is like... Um, it's it's like a fractals, right? Like yeah. when you when you zoom in on fractals, they're just as complex. But it's like every each, e every time each you, fractal you zoom is in. a little dumber than the hole from which it was cut off. I mean, it's it, it's it's an uh, infinite these, regress towards these stupidity. programs are are fractally stupid because the, no matter how much you zoom in on them, right. they remain just as stupid. Yeah. And yes, I absolutely stole that from Neil Stevenson. This is economic. what um, you know the uh, you know taxes should be you know flat, they should be fair, they should be highly visible, and they should as much as possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, encourage as few economic distortions as possible, economic decision making. To get back to Catherine's point about bullying, I, uh, because I am a uh, elder gentleman, I get uh, AARP bulletin. And they helpfully, as you might imagine, Social Security and Medicare, actually probably even more, but Social Security and Medicare are big issues for their readership. And they interviewed Donald Trump and Kamala Harris or people who claim to be them. And uh, this is what, you know, the, one of the first questions was, what are you going to do to make sure that, you know, keep the government out of my Social Security? Trump's answer was, we are going to protect the sanctity of Social Security uh, through growth. That was it. That we're just going to grow the economy and that's going to take care of it. Uh, Kamala Harris's answer was, we're going to keep it safe by making billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share. So, you know, we have equal picks here. Both of them have ironclad plans to keep everything perfect. So rest easy, America. Um, and I think in a lot the of important ways, thing about those ironclad. Is, the important well, I, thing about I, those ironclad plans is that no one, that the vast majority of people, of voters, don't have to do anything different. It yeah. will cost. It will cost you nothing. Is is the essential argument? No, it's going to cost both your kids who aren't talking to you anyway, and your grandkids who you never see, and uh, you know, and constantly trapes uh, dirt into the house or something like that. Uh, they also said when they were asked about Medicare. Uh, this is the way that they were talking about making sure that program never has to change or maybe even get more generous with benefits. Donald Trump said, we're going to make our country successful again. Uh, and then he noted that we will be bigger than Russia and Saudi Arabia combined when it comes to oil and gas production, which we already are. So mission accomplished. Nailed it. And then he said, growth is a very big factor in everything I say. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. Kamala Harris on Medicare making sure that big corporations and the wealthy pay their fair share in taxes, <laughs> which, by the way, they can afford. So this is it. I mean, th that's it. That's as much policy as we're getting. Catherine, can, I, let, can we yes, say, go ahead. though, I, I don't want to be like 100 percent cynical about the growth stuff. Like, obviously, Trump is just using it to be like, look over here, growth. But it is, of course, true that we could do policy changes that would encourage economic growth. I mean, like th there is a there is a coherent worldview in which you say we would like to gear our tax policy, industrial policy, trade policy and others toward economic growth in a meaningful way. Now, this still doesn't mean like presidents create jobs, right? Like, there's like a very stupid version of this. And then there's like the even stupider version that we're trafficking in this election. But I, I guess I as I was listening to us talk, I was thinking we sounded like a little bit too nihilist ourselves, a little bit too cynical ourselves about the possibility that there is such a thing as good tax policy. There is. Now it would like starts with the the revenue and the spending having like some relation to each other, but there there are other components as well. I, yeah, I think the way to, be, to it generate could just growth. be that you pledge it would be a great uh presidential pledge to say, I will not spend more than we raise per year in taxes. You know, with maybe minor adjustments to that. Because if 
We respect. I don't know. That actually 4. sounds like there are too many loopholes there. I think you're uh, going to say you know, we're not going to raise more, and I'm not going to spend more than that. Instead of uh, instead of spending six point two trillion dollars, we'd be spending four point four trillion dollars. That's a start, right? Um, I agree with you, Catherine. Um, and uh, Tyler Cowen a few years ago published a very great short. A wonderfully argued book called Stubborn Attachments. And he said, you know, when you look at all the vagaries of government and things like that, the two things we know is that economic growth leads to increased uh, living standards. And that's a good thing. And that individual freedom is both central and important to liberal governance and to the American tradition. And it tends to create economic growth so that all government policy should really have to answer the question, is this good for individual rights, maintaining or increasing them, and does it lead to economic growth? That would be a great agenda to follow. And unfortunately, the way Trump talks about it and his main uh, attack dog on this is Vivek Ramaswamy, who lies about the idea that all we need to do is have economic growth and then all issues of government spending, debt and deficit, remedy themselves. We, and when I say we, at Reason, we worked out a short video explaining why he is not just a little bit off, but is fundamentally living in cloud cuckoo land. So, um, let's pivot to Ka Kamala a bit. Kamala Harris. Uh, Kamala. Kamala. Thank you. Sorry, just my, my, my mouth was not uh, uh, cooperating. Uh, Peter, um, I see her saying. Uh, the thing that Democrats running for president and now just say, which is that if you don't pay, if you don't earn more than four hundred thousand dollars, we won't tax you one dime. Um, it's just not true necessarily. Um, at the same time, she wants to um, increase the corporate tax rate to twenty eight percent. And there's been some idea. I don't know what the uh, the status of it is lately, because sometimes she gets talked uh, out of her more statist ideas by some of her Goldman Sachs friends, but of taxing unrealized capital gains. Um, so can you maybe explain to me, us, uh, as if we were really dumb, uh, how a corporate tax rate up to 28% and taxing unrealized capital gains might actually... Um, make the $400,000 pledge a lie? So, you know, the corporate tax rate and it's, it's, it's like some people who might end up paying that might make, a, you know, a little less than $400,000. The, uh, the big thing that I think you should focus on here to understand what Kamala Harris is doing is the taxes on unrealized uh, uh, gains there. Because what she is doing is proposing a stupid and terrible fantasy uh, that has no chance of actually happening, but would be terrible and n unworkable if it did. And like, this is the Kamala Harris way. It is also the Democratic Party way to explain how they're going to pay for all the things that they want to pay for uh, right now is they're going to say someone else will pay for it. And they're going to pay for it because they bought a painting 10 years ago and that, they bought that painting for $100,000. And now somebody says it's worth a million dollars and we're going to raise tax revenue off of that. Well, it, really? That's your plan, right? Like is if, if stuff that you own gets increases in value, like that, that you're going to tax people because that, well, what if it decreases in value? Well, you know, we'll, we'll work this out in the code. It'll be fair somehow or another. What matters is that the rich are going to like, it's just, it's a non-answer. It's totally fake. OECD countries that have tried this have mostly reversed their plans to do that sort of thing because it doesn't work. Um, but this is the whole thing is they don't want to provide you with a specific answer that actually answers the question, how are we going to pay for this giant, you know, sort of uh, Nordic socialism, Nordic democratic socialism, uh, you know, type spending model? Um, because what they want is to do the, is to be able to say you can have that and you don't have to pay for it. It's a lie. It's a fantasy. And it's really telling that Kamala Harris has almost nothing to actually say uh, of real substance to actually say about tax policy. Instead, what she is saying is you can just have everything you want and no one will, and you won't have to pay for it. But Catherine, isn't that how we tax property taxes? Right? Like, like you, you like, yeah, you're, you bought the house for a hundred thousand dollars. It's now worth a million. Your taxes are going to be higher, even though you haven't sold the, uh, the illiquid asset. Yeah. Nailed it. That's a bad way of doing that thing too. <laughs> um, it's right. I mean, so we, we are already, everywhere in our tax code, not just federal, but state and local, um, creating just incredible burdens of semi-imaginary accounting. And I think that that's, that's the piece of this that um, you really can't emphasize too much because it would require people to value 
like there are unrealized gains. It's right there in the name. Like they have not in fact realized the gains. They don't know what it's they like are. Like unborn child, it doesn't make sense. Oh my god. Okay. So, anyways, we were talking about taxes, um, and <laughs> the um, the problem here is you're going to create again all kinds of just utterly wild perverse incentives. Uh, if if this goes into place. So yeah, Peter's example of like, I bought a painting for $100,000 and now someone says it's worth 10 million. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They didn't say that. Uh, and so there's, for instance, like a weird downstream effect here where the um, kind of loophole that people have long taken advantage of where they donate art to an art museum and take a tax deduction as a result. And then the art museum has to keep it in the basement forever. Uh, which uh, we have had a, a great article about by Crispin Sartwell in Reason Magazine. Um, that whole thing will change. I don't know for better or for worse, but it's going to radically disrupt just that little slice uh, of the world. And the same thing will be true everywhere. I will note there's also a cliff in the Harris plan at $1 million of taxable income at which these changes apply. Did you earn a million dollars this year? No, you didn't. You earned $999,999, I bet. Um, And that kind of thing, like anything that has kind of a hard cliff, a hard drop off in that way, uh, is just immediately incredibly ripe for exploitation. And um, people who have access to accountants and lawyers will be able to do that. And people who don't will blunder into disastrous financial situations. And these types of tax policies, if you could implement them, would end up empowering the IRS to go through your personal business. I mean, literally your business, but also your personal business in ways that would just be incredibly uh, unpleasant and uh, and incredibly ripe for exploitation and abuse. Uh, Let's do a very, very quick round. Is there anything, we've been pretty negative Nancying over here. Is there any single bit of either candidate's tax proposals and ideas that we think to ourselves, "Eh, that that one looks pretty good. Nick, why don't you start? Uh, no, I don't think so because <laughs> unless you, I mean, well, there isn't, I mean, because the, the two main constituents of revenue in the U S are income taxes and payroll taxes and, uh, you know, corporate tax get t- nets about 10% of federal revenue, uh, OECD countries, other advanced economies, it, it nets about 11, 12%. So we're kind of in the ballpark there. The idea you're going to jack up corporate interest or corporate tax rates, to generate a lot more revenue is unlikely. Payroll tax is where it's at. Neither of these people are talking about that. So I, no, I don't see. I I mean they're they're terrible in different ways. In a way, Kamala Harris is much worse ultimately because uh, in terms of taxing and regulating, because everything she does is designed to like slow down everything um, or make it a little bit harder to do something. So. That's my upbeat assessment. Catherine, do you have any sliver that you like? There are good things in here. Uh, Trump wants to eliminate the double taxation on Americans living abroad. Matt, Mm -hmm. I know you would be happy about that. Reason has written many times about how that is a weird outlier. I think the U.S. and one other country do it. Uh, it Eritrea. Never Eritrea. I can never remember. I'm always like, Somalia? That's not right. Uh, probably because I'm racist. Anyway, uh, he no, it's just because it sounds like a pharmaceutical. Justified it. That's racist. He justified it by saying, "Let's put America first. I don't understand at all how this fits under that rubric, but I don't care. It would be a good idea to eliminate the tax on Americans living abroad. That's it's just a crazy tax that shouldn't exist. Peter, unrealized gains should not be a tax policy. It should be the name of a DC gym chain. I <laughs> that's true. Want- you. That's a good. I like that one. I want you to expire uh, like the the, the tax <laughs> cuts in 2025. Not uh, no, till I, the end of next year. Yeah, that's right. Uh, all right, let's get to uh, our listener question of the week. But only first, after hearing a word from our sponsors over at the University of Chicago. Friends, in an election year, meaning like this year, it's too easy to get lost in the fog of news and opinion. Understanding the real-life impact of political events can be a challenge in these even-numbered years. So have we got a podcast for you. It is called Not Another Politics Podcast. Brought to you by the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public (coughs) Policy Not Another Politics podcast provides clear, research-driven perspectives on the biggest issues of the day. Get the insights you need to truly understand the political landscape. No spin, just facts. Subscribe today at harris.uchicago.edu slash NAPP. That's a lot of stuff. That's harris.uchicago.edu 
slash N-A-P-P, or just look for Not Another Politics Podcast wherever you acquire such instruments of media. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. Uh, all right. Reminder, email your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Doug Allison, who writes... Uh, Reason has had a venerable tradition of the writers and editors penning short essays to explain for whom they will vote for president of these United States. I just received the print edition of the November issue and these expected essays are absent. So will y'all be letting us know for whom you will be voting for or in Catherine's case, abstention? Uh, Catherine, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we might be doing just this exercise as soon as this week. Uh, so uh, why do we do that? Uh, and uh, what can you hint at? We don't want to reveal everything. This is a tease, not a revelation necessarily. Uh, but uh, what, what have you learned? What are, the, what are we building in there? So, uh, yes, we will be rolling out that feature this week online. A couple reasons it's not in the print magazine. One, I think we actually haven't put it in print, uh, at least the last cycle. Two, uh, I don't know if you know this, they switched the candidates pretty late in the the (laughs) cycle this time. Yeah. So, for instance, had we collected people's uh, intended voting plans um, just, just weeks ago, they would have been null and void. Um, so yes, the the entries are rolling in right now, and uh, the the teaser I will offer is uh, frankly not going to surprise listeners to this podcast. Uh, people are not too excited about their options. Uh, we have more um, I haven't decided yet in this cycle than ever before, uh, and so I am going to be forced to tally some of these votes as one half votes <laughs> since at least two staffers submitted either or answers. Um, Shouldn't they be uh, kicked out? The question isn't whether or not you're going to vote. It's who are you voting for? No, and no. If they haven't made people, up their mind, tell them to go to hell. The, they are people who have, who have decided to vote and uh, and are 50-50 between two candidates. I think uh, that's, a, that's reasonable that's, to share. It, it's interesting information. They're categorized, I suppose, as undecided, um, since they are, in fact, undecided. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned for how your your all your fave reasons staffers will vote. People were also much wordier this year, which is interesting. Uh, Lot, Nick, lots more to say. Nick, uh, as someone who is wordy, are you shocked, uh, comma, shocked uh, in the year of our Lord uh, 2024 mm. uh, that we're still pretty well alone on doing yep. this thing that we've been doing since 2004? Yeah, and I'll uh, give a plug, Matt, because when you know when they kick in our front doors, uh, it was you, Matt Welch. I learned it from you, from watching you. You were the one who suggested that we do the uh, staff wide. I was, uh, I was, but a lowly. I was a recent peon. I was. Uh, you were. I think you might have been a contract player. I was you know, like doing a, the uh, twenty five years ago this week. Stage, yeah. In any case. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I am shocked that more pay, uh, more media outfits don't do this. Uh, Slate was the only one. I have no idea if they still exist. Um, they do, but, weirdly. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, Yeah, I mean, I, they're the only ones I know besides us that have been doing it for a long time. Deadspin and, did uh, it. Deadspin did it like a, a sports a, a sports website. A sports website yeah. that doesn't exist yeah. anymore, and they did it just yeah. because... Uh, Tim Marchman, uh, who yeah. I know over there is a funny guy, uh, very lefty, uh, was just irritated that like reason reason would have something over Deadspin. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, I think it's somewhat. Uh, I think it's somewhat useful, and I can't imagine anybody's going to do it. The thing I don't have a lot of respect for are journalists, professional journalists, who say I don't vote because I'm covering this. That's the the uh, halo effect of uh, the movie Perfect, which I think we've discussed several times on this, where John Travolta is a Rolling Stone reporter who goes undercover at a uh, at a health club that is overcharging its customers, and he's trying to get to the heart of the story, and he ends up sleeping with Jamie Lee Curtis as an aerobics instructor, and he realizes that he has gotten too close to the story, and. Uh, when you port that argument over to who are you going to vote for and people say, I'm not going to tell you because I cover politics, that's a real big fuck you to the reader. Uh, uh, it was the name of the health club, Unrealized Gains? I think when you no, end no. up sleeping with Jamie Lee Curtis as part of your investigative report, yeah. those are realized gains. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
You uh, are, uh, and you're probably <laughs> going to write about it too, right? So, uh, Peter, uh, you live in Washington D.C. Uh, what do you think about the idea of think tanks doing this? That'd be fun, wouldn't it? It would be fun, except the whole thing about this is that in journalism, but also in the think tank world, there are at this point so few surprises. I think reason is, uh, it, you know, it, it is to reason's credit that you actually don't know who a lot of the staffers might end up voting for. I, I work here, uh, right? I, I know these folks. I, I hang out and I drink with them. I edit their articles. I read their stuff. And, I, and there are times when I'm surprised by some of the answers here. And part of the thing is that, like, if the New York Times did this, if the Washington Post, but also if Brookings or the American Enterprise Institute uh, did this, I, I think there would be very, very few, not zero, but very few surprises about where, uh, you know, how, how these these places end up uh, sort of uh, voting and uh, the, the people in them. Um, maybe not. Maybe we would we would discover. Oh man, there's a lot of there's a lot of Biden voters at the American Enterprise Institute. But I, I probably Jill I think Stein, probably the whole, you not know, so the much. Classified would be surprising. department at the New York. Times all love Jill Stein. If there's Biden voters, that yeah, yeah, that would make sense to me because they're they have not stayed up to date on what's happening in the election. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like uh, uh, <laughs> did I said Biden, didn't I? Yeah, yeah you know, was, it's they're all the same. You know, uh, no, John Ashcroft's that opponent, was a senior moment. You know, in, in the Missouri Senate race in 2001, right? I I will even though actually, he was dead. He was, I will so. give a, a one teaser, which is that we do have. One reason staffer who um, has participated in the voting forum who will be writing in someone who is no longer actually on the ballot. So I will I will give you that um, mm. from one of the major party primaries. Mm, that's interesting. Um, I will just uh, 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 shout uh, about uh, the you mentioned Slate Nick um, in one uh, cycle of memory. 2004, 2008, I forget which, they disclose their votes. And uh, to Peter's point of like whether it can be surprising, like it wasn't surprising, but the lopsided nature of it was. It was like 55 to 1. That like changes the way that you think about a publication when it's that much in that direction. Um, you know, similarly, people could make. make uh, I, I believe the one Romney voter is now working for the dispatch. Um, uh, and, right. I th and there was like one libertarian voter, which is obviously yeah. Jack Schaefer back in the day. Um, but yeah, I think that it provides interesting information. It's also uh, at heart, like the best reason for doing it is it says to your consumers, your readers, your listeners, whatever, that you trust them. It's fine. You know that they're going to take them out of context when they're trying to, to like say something bad about reason. And it's like, great. Awesome. We, we've given you something to talk about, uh, and we're not afraid of the ramifications of being transparent with the audience that thought was that was supposed to be kind of what journalism was supposed to do. So I, we, uh, I do think, you know, the Washington Post in their bios of writers, they say who they are. And then it's like the first thing you learn about them is what school they went to. <laughs> I think it would I, it would be more meaningful information. If it was, who'd you vote for in the last presidential election? Uh, much uh, more, Matt, yeah. And Matt, uh, is the uh, fifth column going to be doing this? I would be curious to see where that uh, lands. Uh, every episode of the fifth column is uh, some version of that, probably. Uh, but uh, uh, Moynihan's not going to vote. Uh, and Camille is probably going to, uh, you know, hashtag MAGA. I don't know. Um, but that we don't talk about that uh, on this podcast, as Catherine uh, rightly points out. Um, let's go, speaking of uh, medias and podcasts and such, and go quickly. We saw a, uh, an unusually high amount of media and interviewing activity with the candidates for president and vice president on the major uh, Democratic and Republican tickets. Uh, whether it was Kamala Harris on uh, Donald uh, Donald Stern, <laughs> that'd be yeah. funny. That's that's uh, what I, I would watch. love. Wow, Donald that would be great. Stern having a, a yeah. radio show. That would be everyone great. at Brookings is going to be voting for Donald Stern. I think so. Yeah. Probably not. Probably, uh, I, I don't think so. Donald Trump or Howard Trump, apparently, according to my brain, uh, was also interviewed by uh, comedian Andrew Schultz, former fifth column guest. Uh, unsurprisingly, these efforts. Uh, led to a metric fudge ton of cringe. So let's go quickly around the table and uh, pick out one cringeworthy moment that we observed in the last seven days since last we convened here around this fictional table. Catherine, what did you say that see that made you go? Ugh. 
Kamala Harris went on Stephen Colbert and um, they did this like, oh, well, since the election is all vibes, who would you like to have a beer with? And then they pulled out um, purportedly at her request, Miller High Life in cans and the champagne of beers those open and as she was opening her she said you know the last time i had a beer was at a baseball game with my husband and i was like oh god i hate every single thing that's happening here and then did she like start talking about home runs in the 1970s and yeah right so it's like obviously she's not out here drinking a lot of beer and then um the best moment of that interview was Stephen colbert saying uh okay um, let's name our favorite billionaires, one, two, three. And then he said, Oprah, really fast. Then he was like, you can't have Oprah, who's yours? And she said, in all seriousness, we have to agree that f- teachers and firefighters and nurses shouldn't be paying a higher tax rate than billionaires. Hate it. Hate every bit of it. Pick a billionaire, girl. There's perfectly nice ones out there. Uh, Peter, uh, what what cringed you? So Lulu Garcia Navarro of the New York Times interviewed J.D. Vance, and the standout moment from that interview was that she asked him five times, did Trump lose the 2020 election? And every single time, J.D. Vance just didn't answer. Instead of responding directly with a yes or a no, he would say some version of the words, did big technology companies censor a story that independent studies have suggested would have cost Trump millions of votes? And he just says this over and over again, like he's stuck on a loop, like he's a broken, like he's a record, you know, skipping because somebody's, because you, you, you got one of those uh, floor, the, you live in an apartment with like, where the, that's bouncy. Does anybody else have a record player and floors that kind of bounce? When did Joe Biden become a member of this <laughs> podcast? <laughs> I feel like somehow uh, you don't want to answer this question and this is your strategy. The whole, the whole, it's, it was bizarrely repetitious. The whole thing showed it was just embarrassing because what you what you see is Vance doesn't want to say, well, of course Trump won the election. He doesn't want to just be a flat out election denier who says Trump won, period. That's not Vance's position. Vance's position is I'm not going to say the words Trump lost. And he's not going to say the words Trump lost because he knows that Trump lost because Vance is too smart to not know this. He is not a true believer. And so this is entirely an exercise in a... Trumpy cynicism. And it's just gross the way that he has let Trump abuse him um, and and make him uh, into into somebody who can't just say the thing that he absolutely knows. I, uh, why are you shaming his submissiveness? Uh, Donald Trump isn't abusing him. He signed up for this. He loves this. I mean, it's a it's a, a time honored role of the vice president to eat their own uh, previous policies for uh, for breakfast crow. Uh, Nick, what did you see that was uh, cringeworthy? Uh, for me, the most cringeworthy uh, interview moment happened on uh, Howard Stern's interview of Kamala Harris. And Stern was, I mean, Stern is like Jack Nicholson after the lobotomy in One Flew of the Cuckoo's <laughs> Nest. It's like, what <laughs> happened to this guy? And I mean, it happened years ago, a decade or so ago. But he wore a suit and tie to interview the vice president. He talked about how, you know, I, I had a day off. But the only person I would come to work for today was the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris. And it's like, wow, this is just awful. But at one point, uh, he was leading her on. Uh, and all of these interviews uh, were... Uh, you know, so uh, begging, you know, Kamala Harris to be better than she was. But he's like, you know, people talk about you as if you like want to have people free and walking the streets, criminals. You, you know, you are a super prosecutor. You put people in jail. And she actually said, I have put a lot of people in jail. Like she is so proud to talk about putting people in jail. And it's just the, the whole setup was cringeworthy, matched almost by her appearance on The View, which was another one of these awful uh, kind of gaggles of people just, you know, telling her to be better than she is. But they love her and she's the greatest candidate ever. And she was asked, like, what would she have done differently than the Biden that Biden did? And she said, literally not a thing. So it's like, then why did we swap out, you know, uh, Grandpa Joe uh, but ultimately, the worst, absolute worst thing was that fucking ad, uh, you know, with fake men 
and by that I mean actors playing men, where a an enormously fat, I mean like a wrestling villain fat level farmer who is looked like he was spreading chicken feed on plants turns to the camera and says i eat carburetors for breakfast <laughs> and it's like maybe Where that's was... why you're so fucking fat i it was, uh, uh, do we have confirmation aside. that this is not uh uh, it is it's two, two things. It is no, it it's not. A, but it's it was done by Harris Stance. Uh, it's yeah, not. So this did not that come is from not that. A, it's I, not I an official of, campaign thing, but it is yeah. not an anti-Harris false flag. Do we know flag. that is, they're Harris stands? I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, and Iowa Hawk blog, by the way, on Twitter had a long extended, you know, because once you mention carburetors, he he appears. <laughs> yeah. And he pointed out, among other things, that he's very concerned about the carburetor eating because the last ca production car in America that was sold, new car that was sold with carburetors, because they don't really use them anymore, was in 1994. And by his calculation, within a decade, we'll have, be out of carburetors. So we're going to be in big trouble. That ad was so cringe that I am not convinced that it isn't parody. Uh, it d did not. I don't think it came from the actual Harris campaign. It definitely the, did The not. reports suggest that it was entirely serious from some outside group, but it is so on the nose that I, I'm just not sure I believe that it wasn't intended as a satire of some sort. It, it has to have. I mean, it has to have been, right? I just, I, we can't be so bad at that. We've, we've been doing campaign ads for so long. Could we really be so bad at this? We had ads for Obama and uh, his reelection campaign where uh, Jason Bateman, in the name of supporting Obama and environmentalism, pledged that if Obama was reelected, he would only flush the bathroom if he had a bowel movement. And that was an ad. That was like not parody <laughs> or anything. So I think we've been in this <laughs> rabbit hole for too do you, long. Do you I think just, that his bathroom troubles were because he was eating carburetors for breakfast? Maybe. It might be. I don't know. They, a lot it's of like roughage in, in that. Yeah. Fiber? Yeah. It, I don't know. Maybe it's He's the a fuel man. injectors are the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My cringe nominee uh, is Donald Trump. Uh, not even Donald Stern, uh, but Donald uh, J. Trump, who is apparently back on Twitter. I didn't fully realize that before, but he was responding to the uh, contested, uh, controversial uh, uh, 60 Minutes interview with Kamala Harris, uh, in which, among other things, 60 Minutes, which always does heavy editing, uh, edited an answer uh, on a question about Israel that wasn't really her answer. <laughs> it's kind of just really bizarre. And then released another video that was a completely separate answer, which different uh, valence uh, overall. Anyways, um, his response to that was to call it, and I think you'll know when uh, I'm reading uh, all caps, a fake news scam, which is totally illegal. Take away the CBS license. Election interference. She is a moron, capitalized, and the fake news media wants to hide that fact. An unprecedented <laughs> scandal. The Dems got them to do this and should be forced to concede the election, question mark? <laughs> Seriously, people! This it's been eight like years a, of this! At you, least Larry King put ellipses in his USA exactly, Today column, suggesting, exactly. no, there, there's a gap here that you need to fill in. Something's uh, been removed, it's, and it's the logic. Not, it's not totally illegal. Uh, you shouldn't take away their license. Uh, it's not election interference. She might be a moron. I don't really know. It's not. I'm not really judgy like that. Uh, and it's not an unprecedented scandal. Uh, and also, the Dems shouldn't be forced to concede the election. That is like five major things wrong in about 27 words. Um, so I find that cringeworthy because it's embarrassing at this point. That anyway. interview also was worth watching because it, you know uh, what you find with Harris whenever she is asked a follow up question um, or challenge to explain a little bit more she kind of falls apart i she mean melts. i i thought that i thought the 60 minutes uh interview was actually quite informative yeah um uh mark whitaker i think his name is uh, did a, a a pretty good job All right let's go to our end of podcast what we have been consuming in the cultural arena i guess Catherine and peter uh, attend the same book club or some crap what do you guys read 
So I believe both of us over the summer read the new Neil Stevenson novel, Polo Stand. It comes out tomorrow, I believe, this week. Uh, it is um, it is a historical epic, the first of three books uh, in what he is calling his bomb light trilogy about the dawn of the atomic age. But really, this one is about communism and science and why one of them is bad and the other one is good. And you can guess, given given our own predilections here on this podcast, which one is bad. Uh, it's communism. And the book is so funny about how stupid communism is. It does this great thing that it sort of treats communism very seriously and deadpan straight-facedly. And then also, it, and then in the process of that, just shows you how that era of communism of the 1930s, so this is a, um, this sort of a... This, most of the book is set around the, the 1930s and sort of the dawn of the, the communist era. And it just shows you how cruel, how stupid, how pointless, how incredibly wasteful of resources and talent the entire communist apparatus edifice is. Uh, and, and it does so in a way that just sort of is like, oh, this is correct and funny. But then the other thing it does is it offers you a tour of America around the 1930s. Uh, so you get to see San Francisco as the Golden Gate Bridge is going up. You get to see the World's Fair in Chicago. There is this great long segment in the, in the World's Fair uh, where it just sort of walks you through what is going on in Chicago and all of the wonders and the way that this the Chicago World Fair's wonders sort of um, like there's there's echoes uh, in in today's technology but he's just reminding us that the world we live in is this wonderful scientific miracle that goes back decades or a century. Um, and it's it's fun, it's episodic. It is also, as I said, only the first of three books, which means it's really, it's kind of a third of a book. Like most Neil Stevenson novels are about 900 pages long. This one's only 300 pages, but that's because he only wrote the first third of the story. It's, um, it's really delightful. If you like Neil Stevenson, if you hate commies, if you love science, you will enjoy this book. I all those things describe me, and I did enjoy this book. Uh, I will just add that um, many people are saying, as Donald Trump would say, many people are saying that this book is uh, similar to Quicksilver, which was the first book in his Baroque cycle. Neil Stevenson's Baroque cycle is the only Neil Stevenson I've never been able to finish, and that's really saying something. So I am a little concerned about that. Um, and the passages about the World's Fair are too much. Now and always, Neil Stevenson desperately needs an editor and he simply will not be accepting one. There are – he it's the whole map of the World's Fair. I believe that I read about every single booth in the Chicago World's Fair. And it's not that they were uninteresting as individual vignettes, but it was too much. Um, still, I read it. I will read the next one. Neil Stevenson – now and always a delight. It wasn't too much, and it's very much in keeping with Neil Stevenson's ticks. If you, I mean, if you don't like Neil Stevenson, you're not going to like this book. But he has always had an obsession with describing environmental detail in vast and sort of gleeful uh, expansiveness, right? Like, like he 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 takes you around a place and is just like, let me show you every little detail of this physical location and help you understand not just what it looks like, but how it functions. There is a, a description in like. Like chapter two or three of a Russian blast furnace and all of the workers and all of the crazy stuff that is a that is like being built and done around there and also the ways that it's incredibly wasteful and abusive and inhumane. Um, but he's just like, I I have mapped this thing out in my head and I'm now going to offer you a tour of this entire facility so that you will understand not only how it works, but also how it is a metaphor for the deep stupidity of the communist system. I will let our listeners decide which of us is the right person to judge whether <laughs> There was too much description about a thing. <laughs> well, well played, oh, uh, Nick. What did you? Uh, what did you consider? Uh, putting me uh, on blast furnace. <laughs> I uh, I read Charm: How Magnetic Personalities Shape Global Politics by Julia Sonavend, who is a sociologist, and um, it is a look at how charm, or what she calls magnetic personalities, uh, affect politics, and she talks about people such as the, uh, you know, on, across the political spectrum. So people like Kim Jong-un are here, Angela Merkel, uh, the New Zealand uh, prime minister during COVID, uh, Viktor Orban. And it's a really great look at the ways in which different leaders connect with their audiences and how that either hurts them or mostly helps them. 
Um, and I, I highly recommend this book. She says that what she's calling charm here, and it's kind of charisma. Uh, it can be sometimes be a negative charisma if you're trying to be very authentic and part of that authenticity. And this is somebody like Angela Merkel, where it's just you don't have a personality. And so what you're presenting uh, is who you really are and, and a sincere person. And that has a power of its own. Or somebody like Viktor Orban, uh, and she talks about how uh, his campaigns, uh, both kind of traditional ad campaigns, but especially things like Instagram feeds and his direct connection with an audience um, allow him to connect with people in a way that I think a lot of times people who disagree with a political program or are just put off by somebody can't really understand their appeal. Um, the one, uh, I wouldn't even say it's a criticism of of the book because it was obvious a, a choice. Donald Trump is the... Uh, you know, is the ghost haunting this banquet? But uh, Charm by Julia Sonnevend is, uh, is a book that, you know, in a world where policy matters less and kind of vibe and uh, a connection of some sort with the voting public uh, matters, uh, Charm is, is the book to be reading. Nick, does this book grapple with the rise of the term Riz? Uh, it was written after Riz became a, or rather before. So it is not quite talking about Riz. Um, but, uh, you know, that phenomenon is, is I think, is largely, uh, uh, you know, kind of in, internal to, or, you know, it's subsumed by the way that she talks about charm and how it operates in different contexts. So speaking of Riz, uh, I watched for the first time in three decades a movie that was the most important movie probably to me when I was 16 years old, and I watched it with my 16-year-old. So that was pretty fun. Uh, that is, uh, of course, as a good Gen Xer, uh, The Breakfast Club, uh, John Hughes's uh, $1 million movie that made $51 million at the box office and uh, launched the Brat Pack as a phenomenon, uh, although some of them had been uh, bubbling around for a while. Uh, it uh, was really, really, really interesting. Uh, the 16-year-old mine, uh, uh, said that Judd Nelson had no riz. She's like, no, I don't, I don't get this. Uh, no riz at all. She didn't like it at all. And I love that. Uh, she was actually, of course, uh, uh, texting through it and, and whatnot, but she thought it was too boring, um, that, uh, none of the, the characters were made sense to her in any way, except for Anthony Michael Hall, which is, those, those, that's kind of how it is sort of intended. Uh, and I was, Surprised to discover that I love it just as much as I ever did. Like, I, I apparently lack any critical distance of it at all. It is interesting to watch as a middle-aged person now and seeing uh, just like... Is there was something wrong with Johnny Hughes. <laughs> I don't know what uh, I don't know where they touched him in science class, but uh, like it's a uh, uh, he's he had some issues, and thank God for it because he made uh, some pretty interesting movies. I'm not a huge uh, John Hughes fan, actually. I don't like uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and um, I wasn't fully under the sway of his other stuff. But this one hit me square between the eyes. It's very talky um, and slow. It's basically a play. Um, and, uh, with, uh, bad archetypes, then they subvert the archetypes, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Emilio Estevez deserves like a posthumous Oscar. I, I think he's still alive, but, um, for like having to produce some of the worst written speeches you've, you've ever seen. Uh, like the characters don't like none of them really strike you as plausible. Um, uh, particularly Judd Nelson, who of course is the hero of every 16 year old uh, boy who doesn't want to be Anthony Michael Hall. They want to be Judd Nelson. Um, it's impossible for someone that like talentedly sociopathic to not be more actually sociopathic than he ends up being in it. And none of it matters. It's just, it's very good. The thing that I like about it the most is that it captures a, a, a quality about being young that is uh, uh ever present, which is that people will go through these incredible emotional roller coasters and then snap out of it um, in the same sentence if the snapping out of it can lead to just stupid like fart jokes or hijinks of some sort. Fun. Uh, there's an element of fun to it that is uh, essential to the youthness. Um, so check it out. Breakfast Club. It's still with us. Um, and Matt, watch it who did you identify with? In the Breakfast Club, um, I identified with uh, besides uh, Ali Sheedy, pre makeover Ali Sheedy, um, yeah. and also think that pre makeover yeah. Ali Sheedy was hotter. 
And I say everybody this is, that yeah. that's an that's, uncontroversial take at this yeah, point. Yeah, uh, but, I, but I was I was shocked, as was uh, my daughter, of like hmm. the makeover Ali Sheedy. It's like, oh, oh that's um, uh, you may want to uh, go with uh, your daughter to watch or watch with your daughter River's Edge, which came out a few year late, a few years later. And it's kind of the breakfast club uh, outside. Yeah, Matt. I don't know if you remember that Keanu Reeves. I, I own a sky masterpiece. I own a sky. I, uh, friend, of uh, a teen alienation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah. It's it is it's a fun thing to watch with with your teens, uh, Catherine. So when your teens started acting real teeny, um, I I recommend looking uh, at the teen movies of your youth. My uh, tweens and early teen. Uh, introduced their granny to the princess bride this weekend oh she was babysitting and they picked a movie and she had never seen the princess bride and they had and so they were like it's time for you to get educated granny and that's how that went down and if i may say my parenting is going spectacularly uh please tell me that granny shared my disdain for the movie she liked it she said it was it was quote Quite amusing, which for her is is pretty pretty solid review. Stop it with the rhymes. I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? Uh, all right, that's all the really <laughs> really lame jokes we have time for here at the Reason Roundtable podcast from uh, the movie. If the you movie. like uh, what we do as a uh, as an organization, please consider a tax deductible donation over there. Reason.org slash donate. All of our podcasts live at reason.com slash podcasts. We have a number of events uh, upcoming, including the Reason Roundtable live in New York City at the Village Underground, which is totally sold out, of course. Um, but you can get on the waiting list, and I recommend that you do so. And even if you don't, like, get in. These comedy clubs and drinks and stuff. It's fun. New York, fun, great. Love it. Uh, Nick, uh, other stuff you want to uh, riz up here at the end? Yeah. On uh, Thursday, October 24th, uh, we'll be doing a live interview with Musa Al Garbi, a sociologist whose book, uh, We Were Never Woke, is out and uh, offers a fascinating insight into contemporary uh, elite academic and media uh, uh, culture, but also what's happening in the election, apparently, where we're seeing uh, uh, racial and ethnic and working class groups uh, separating from the Democratic Party. Uh, uh, Musa Al Garbi's book is fascinating. He's a good guy. That's in Midtown. You can go to reason.com slash events to check that out, as well as we've got a couple of uh, upcoming Soho Fora and whatnot. All right. We'll see you next week. Catherine won't uh, because she's a traitor to her class, but uh, uh, some version of us will be here next Monday. Goodbye. Goodbye.